Okay, <clears throat> so I decided to focus on a particular, on a specific case, and that's Burkina Faso, which is a country where we saw quite sustained economic growth, but only little poverty reduction. And it's a case which is quite representative for many of the uh, Francophone West African countries. It's a uh, joint work with Claude Weta and Aude Nikema, both from Burkina Faso. And yeah, you will see in a minute why we refer here to the Malthusian trip. Good, so here you see the, the whole picture. You see uh, the growth of GDP per capita. It's on average over this period, 1994 to 2012, uh, almost 3%. So that's uh, quite good. Um, it's, there are few interruptions due to droughts and uh, the, the food crisis uh, later on. But now if you look at the red squares, there you see the poverty headcount estimate. And uh, you see an increase of poverty in the earlier period and then a decline. But this decline is not very pronounced. The, the high level of poverty in 1998, that is in particular due to the drought that just preceded uh, this survey. So that's exactly referring to the point David made. So a survey done directly after a very bad harvest, of course, gives you a very high level of poverty. If you look at the overall trend, then, well, you see that there's only modest poverty reduction, you know, compared to the uh, growth of GDP that uh, we experienced here. So here you see the growth elasticity of poverty. So it's just relating the, the change in poverty to the change in GDP per capita. And you see it's minus 0.5. So that is really low. Yeah, you see a few other countries here. I mean, this is, of course, not a representative sample. But it's by international standards, this is really a low growth elasticity of poverty. So there's something here with the distribution that we need to understand, right? Good. So here you get, um, in short, the story, and then I try to provide the empirical evidence that supports uh, the points that you find on this slide. So there are two sources of uh, growth here. The first is that we have a massive migration from rural areas to urban areas. Yeah? So people migrating from the countryside into the uh, cities, and or there are not so many in Burkina, in fact, but entering there the informal sector mainly. And the second source of growth is a modest agriculture groups. And this is not due to um, tremendous increase in productivity. It's mainly due to an expansion of land. Okay? So there's almost no sign of any structural transformation in the country, neither in agriculture nor uh, in the uh, urban economy. And because there's this low agriculture productivity, we see in this country a huge increase in the price of food. And this is, of course, um, makes it very difficult somehow for the, for the poor, so it's really eroding their purchasing power. And this, at the end, you will see, explains this low elasticity um, of poverty with respect to growth. Yeah? And it's endogenous food price inflation. Yeah? So it's, you will see some of the food price inflation, the reflection of this low increase or the, the very little increase in agriculture productivity. Good, so now let me lead you through a few tables and figures. So here you see GDP growth by sector. So these are aggregate numbers. And you see the primary, secondary, and tertiary sector. So all these sectors have experienced aggregate growth. I mean, you saw this in the beginning when I showed you the, the GDP figure. But what we are, of course, interested in is, I um, mean, how does it look like in per capita terms, right? So here you see a few numbers on population growth. So the total fertility rate is still very high in Burkina Faso. It's uh, around five. And you see that we have a rate of uh, population growth, um, I mean, depending on the exact period you look at, but between 2.5 and 3.5%, even going up recently a bit because mortality was going down. Now, if you look at this separately for rural and urban areas, then we see in rural areas, um, we have about 2%, so this shows you already that many people are leaving the countryside, therefore the aggregate um, demographic growth is a bit lower than the national average. And in urban areas, in particular, more recently, we see that we have a growth rate of 7%, uh, very strong in Ouagadougou, the capital, but also in the uh, second city, Bobodia Lozou. And if you look at the smaller towns, we have 8%. Yeah? So a massive uh, urbanization here. So if we bring this now into the uh, sectoral GDP growth, then we see that you know, there's um, no growth in the, um, in the tertiary sector. That's, I mean, there are some fluctuations, of course, but over, looking at this over the entire period, there's really no growth. In the, um, in the secondary sector, same picture, even going down a bit. 
And then, as I said, this little growth in agriculture, right? And of course, there are huge differences in level. So again, one source of growth that we see is simply that people went from this sector here to this sector, yeah? So they increased, of course, their income by doing this, but we do not see within this sector any uh, growth in, in productivity. Good. Now, if we focus uh, more specifically now on agriculture, uh, sorry, uh, these are first on the, sorry, on the uh, employment structure. So you see this for rural areas and for urban areas. So in rural areas, um, well, this is mainly agriculture. It's uh, a lot of subsistence agriculture. There was, given the devaluation of the CFA franc in 1994, and then this rise of the international price for cotton, and this is the main, or was at that time, the main export commodity of Burkina, uh, many people somehow switched to cotton production. But, well, we do not have figures here for 2007, but if you look here, the, we have numbers on the households involved in cotton production. You see that this is already going down again a bit because the international price went down and they are also hitting limits here to further land expansion, further land that can be used for cotton production. Now, interestingly, if you look at the urban economy, we see that the share of those working in the public sector is pretty stable over this entire period and all the private formal sector is pretty stable. Yeah, it's around seven to eight percent. So still the, the majority of the workforce is in the informal sector. Yeah, so there's, I mean, in terms of employment structure, no sign here of any, you know, industrialization and increase of the private formal and, and probably more productive sector. Good. Now, specifically on the agriculture. So I separated this here for food crops and cotton. Again, cotton, the main export commodity. And if you look at the land use, so this is this column here for food crops and this year for cotton, then we see a massive expansion of land, more than 2% per year uh, for food crops and almost 8% uh, for cotton, right? And if you look now at the yields, then you see it's um, modest 1%, 1.2% for the food crops and 1% for cotton. So that's exactly the opposite that we would find, say, if you look at Indonesia, you know, during the, the Green Revolution, you would see a huge increase in productivity. We do not see this here. Yeah? It's mainly land. And of course, land is limited, so this can't be a sustainable source of economic growth. Good. And um, I said already that somehow the, um, the opportunities for making money in cotton that uh, went um, not so, I mean, was quite good in the beginning here after the devaluation and when the international price uh, rose. But then somehow this is nowadays not anymore really um, a very promising um, source of growth. Yeah. Good. So what is the consequence on food prices you know, of this uh, low increase of productivity? Um, so here you see a couple of commodities. The main food crops people consume are millet, sorghum and uh, mice. And you see these uh, three commodities here. It's quite volatile of, volatile, of course, but if you look at the trend line, there's a huge increase in the in the average price of these commodities. Yeah? So it's becoming more and more expensive for the households to, um, to um, finance their consumption. If you look at the CPI, that's this bold line. So the, here the increase is much lower. Yeah? And there's one commodity rise where the increase is not so tremendous. But if you compute the cost per calorie, it's much higher than for these other commodities. So that's not really a commodity house poor households can substitute in. Okay? So they have to rely yeah, that's fine, um, on these three other commodities. Good. If you look at their budget shares, um, so again for these uh, three survey, survey years, 94, 98 and 2003, then you see that in 94, um, the, the poorest quinta, the poorest 20% spent about 60% on food and of this 27% on the food crops. Now in 98, after this uh, drought year, this was even 70%. And in 2003, which was a much better year in terms of the um, agriculture production, still this was close to 70%. And even if you look at the richer quintile, the Q5, it's quite high. And it's much higher this share than what you find in the CPI. Yeah? So this has implications of how you compute uh, your poverty figures. Yeah? And now you could say, well, if the prices are high, is that not, I mean, good news for rural households? Because some of them should be net sellers of these uh, commodities. Um, so we have 
let, let me go to 98. So you see 94% of rural households are producing these crops, but only 15% were selling these crops and the share of the purchased food crops is 50% uh, uh, of the total consumption. So the, the typical household or the majority of the households, they are not sellers. They are not net sellers and do not benefit from this uh, price increase, right? Good. Um, now, um, what does it mean, this, uh, this huge increase in food prices for our poverty figures? Typically, we inflate our poverty line over time with the CPI. But this is, of course, wrong if somehow the, the poor consume much more food in relative terms than other income groups, and if food prices rise much stronger than other prices. So here you see a modified version of the um, debt rebellion <coughs> decomposition, though the standard decomposition is that you decompose a change in poverty in a gross component and a redistribution component. So we added here a third component, which is the, the difference in the inflation between the poverty line and the CPI. So to what extent the purchasing power of the poor has been eroded more than the average. And if you look over the entire period, 1994 to 2003, you see that growth and redistribution contributed to poverty reduction, but a lot of this was offset by this huge inflation that was relevant to the poor, right? Good, and you see this even, yeah, that's fine. Um, if you look at malnutrition for children, <coughs> Um, which improved in many years, uh, in, in, in many other countries, you see here in Burkina Faso, at least in this earlier period, 1998 and 2003, that, uh, for instance, the share of children stunted increased strongly between 93 and 98. Again, keep in mind there was a drought, but even 2003 quite high, and only afterwards somehow this is going uh, down a bit. So this also is, of course, not any causal um, conclusion that I can draw here, but it somehow suggests that this food price inflation has also some effects on health, in particular children's health. Good. So to conclude, um, we have a country here where we have uh, massive uh, population growth. So in absolute numbers, the population since 1985 has doubled. Um, we have in absolute numbers, because we talked this morning about the relative um, the, the headcount and also the absolute numbers of poor. So here we have a case where we have now one million people more in poverty than in 1994. And um, well, given that every year now about 0.3.5 million men and women are entering the labor force, um, somehow we, we need some structural transformation to deal with this, right? And I mean, you may have heard in the news there was again a coup d'etat. And so there's certainly not the best precondition for making this change happen. I think the, the study highlights uh, nicely the role of endogenous food price inflation and what that means for the measurement of inequality and uh, poverty. Yeah? If you account for this differential inflation, you see an increase in inequality over time. If you would just use um, expenditures deflated by the CPI, then you do not see this increase. That's yeah? just by accounting for the differential inflation that you have across the income distribution. And two last comments, and then I'm done. Um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, discussion in the media about the um, growth prospects in Africa and the poverty reduction, and there are two papers that are uh, very often mentioned, in particular in, in magazines like The Economist, the paper by Pinkowski and Salai Martin, which is now published in the Journal of Economic Growth, and the one by Young, uh, published in the Journal of Political Economy, and both are very optimistic um, about the uh, poverty decline that we have seen recently. And just to say, in the two approaches, so the first is largely based on, on aggregate figures, and the, uh, the, the thing by Salai Martin and the second one by Young looks at asset ownership, that both methodologies would not um, somehow take into account the, the effect that we see here that stems from the food price inflation. Yeah, if you look at assets, for instance, this is based on an assumption that you have a constant income elasticity of asset demand. But it's clear if you have huge changes in relative prices that you cannot make the assumption that the income elasticity of asset demand is constant over time. And therefore, taking this into account, I think the results would look very different what you see in Young. So we should probably take these uh, studies with a, with a lot of caution. And um, I mean, David said it already, we, the one aim of this project, of this gap, was really to do very detailed country case studies and somehow to get this triangle between gross poverty and inequality right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.